What three elements did you mention again? The three elements that... Uh, uh, the elements were uh, roughly that I wanted to tell a story and make a point. Yes. Or make a point and use a story as an illustration. Or use the materials of my own life. Thank you in order to say something about some larger issue than me. Thank you very much. <coughs> Let me read you a couple of pieces, and uh, they're relatively short, and uh, I, I uh, uh, published them at different times. This one is from two, 2003, and it's called West of the Westernmost Point. When I was 12, and living on the Caribbean island of Curacao, one of my classmates drowned. He and his family had gone swimming in West Punt Bay, and Lowy Tramberg, I remember his first and last name, had swum too far out and was seized by a current which took him out to sea west of this most western point on the island. Fifty-five years later, I still remember hearing the news at school and being sent reeling by it. I saw Lowy, small, helpless, his white body ever heavier in that black blue sea, west of the island's westernmost point. I thought of it for days, weeks, and always it stunned me. It's not that I believe talking never helps. We know the relief that comes to anyone from airing a grief or bringing up a problem. It's just that some things are too deep for speech and too irrevocable for mediation. It's for that reason I feel skeptical of our present habit of dispatching grief counselors to the scene of any tragedy. Would I have felt better if I had talked to a grief counselor on the day of Lowy's drowning? I doubt it. What is the point of sending a perfect stranger, however sympathetic, however well-trained, two big howevers, to comfort children after a tragedy? Is their sorrow not precisely the appropriate emotion why should we desire its instant conversion to something easier? I think it is our sentimentality, our desire to make it all feel better, that guides us in this impatient hope of transmuting grief and pain to wholesome healing. And not one, not one of them could possibly undo the awful knowing that a friend was floating west into an unfathomable sea. Mm. Rather unexpressed. Many think of me as unemotional. I don't go in for the usual displays of feeling. And I have never been fond of the give-me-a-hug style that so many people still favor. My conviction, or my inclination, or my practice, tells me that if I listen to you, consider what you're thinking and feeling, then I am responding to you, and potentially doing so with feeling. Attention is my way of displaying interest, fondness, emotion. Should such attention develop on both sides, then the intimacy of friendship could result. This is widely misunderstood. I am regarded as, quote, cold because I'm not being emotive, and don't say I love you to people I don't love. Someone who tells me how much he cares for me but has forgotten what I told him yesterday does not win my affection 
or persuade me that he cares. Someone who asks me a question but doesn't really hear my answer is not someone I'll ever care for. My response to such people will be correct, but by their lights cold, no matter how often they declare their affection, esteem, or even love. In fact, when they do, I hold it against them. Such people allege what they demonstrably don't feel. It's easier to say, I love you, than to love. It's even easier to say, I like you, than to really like someone. I'm thinking of one man in particular who frequently tells me I'm a great man. I cringe when he does. He has known me for over 10 years, but doesn't know me. He hasn't taken the time to find out what I think or feel, and it's inappropriate and intrusive for him to say what he does. When he asks for my view on something, he's too impatient to hear my answer and starts talking before I'm through. His statement isn't even about me. It's about his need to be loved. He wants me to say in return that I think he's pretty great himself, which of course I do not, being cold. <laughs> Evidently, his form of admiring or loving is not based on any knowledge of the person he allegedly admires. It's based on his need or his wish it has nothing to do with me. It's a form of rampaging sentimentality, an indiscriminate <coughs> yearning to express emotion and to quickly, quickly, quickly gain a return of feeling. He wants his emotional high, but it's the unearned emotion of the drunk. Unearned is the key. Genuine like or love has to be earned, to be won. It cannot be solicited or seized. His expressions of, quote, feeling are ways of leaping over the usual ways of earning love or esteem. Like the person who praises himself because others won't, he seeks to gain an instant assent from you. He'll con you into stating your admiration by first flattering you to the point where some similar response seems called for. None of this would be particularly significant if we didn't see this pattern at work as a style in the culture at large, which is nothing if not mawkish, which always avoids the hard job of gaining trust in favor of exhorting you to trust, which holds candlelight vigils for victims it refuses to truly mourn, which favors sloganeering sentiment and gushy words over thoughtfulness, attention, and care. It's much easier to say indignantly, what about the children? than to show or make one less violent movie or video game. So much easier to say I love you to a friend and put yourself out for that same friend. So much easier to settle for the sentimental tear than the actual experience of sorrow. So much easier to talk than to listen. 